on. Here we go. Welcome everybody, Friday afternoon, and therefore it must be where the road leads. Uh, coming to you from the studios downtown Honolulu of Think Tech Hawaii. In our program series, Where the Road Leads, we talk about technology, how technology can assist and make our life better here in Hawaii, and, and solve to solve problems. Technology being the solution of problems as an art, as much as a, as a hard science. We've got a lot of uh, four excellent uh, guests on today and are distributed from here in Honolulu to Fairbanks, Alaska by Skype and to the Big Island in the, in the uh, Punapahoa area. So I'm going to get right on with our guests in a moment here, but just setting the stage, we've talked uh, lately the last uh, four weeks perhaps about, about preparedness, civil preparedness, the disaster preparedness, and uh, the reason for that, of course, was we've had a lot of disaster preparedness fairs in Manoa, in Eva, in Kailua, coming up next week. And we've had some serious issues to deal with, in, both in the Puna area, Puna of the hurricane a month ago, and now the upcoming lava flow situation. So it's appropriate we focus on those because they're really important for us here in Hawaii, and it's important to get our, our technology in on those programs, important to hear also what the people performing that technology today would like to see as an additional capability added to their to their quiver in the future. So at the end of the show today, what I'd like to do is ask our four guests, uh, uh, Peter Webley up in, uh, up in Fairbanks, uh, Nick, um, Nick Turner in uh, Kona, uh, David Takeyama and Eric uh, Yamashita here with me. At the end of this, after you've had a chance to think about it, in each of your four domains, what would you want as the next level of evolution or development in the particular line of technology that you execute in, in ways to take things like Azel and take things like the Pahoa Lava Flow and make them uh, quicker in terms of resolution, quicker in terms of informing higher level of information coming to the decision makers and to the public. So uh, with that as a background, uh, and I guess I'll also say one thing. We should have started the show on time. We got to the airport late. Margie and I just got back from Alaska. We were there for a week-long conference, an excellent conference, on the subject matter of unmanned air vehicles performing work in exactly this domain. Right now my head is full of all the information we collected. We'll distill it and bring it to you at this table in probably in two weeks. Uh, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and talk about the situation that's emerging in Pahoa and how we can think about that from the perspective of technology that we have today and technology that would be nice to have but we could develop it uh, for tomorrow. So to set the stage, let's turn to Nick Turner who is on the ground uh, in the Puna Pahoa area. Uh, Nick is a geospatial analyst and UAV practitioner with a lot of experience in the recent uh, hurricane activity and standing by to help in the, in the emerging lava flow. Nick, can you give us a little bit of a background on what the status is today and how technology that we've spoken of in the past couple of programs can come to the table and assist as you see it today? Uh, definitely. Um, so right now the situation is the uh, lava flow is still advancing towards uh, Pahoa Town. And uh, for those that don't know, Pahoa Town is probably the main, uh, the, the largest town in Puna and it's pretty much surrounded by uh, different neighborhoods um, and the total population of Lower Puna alone is at least 10,000 people. So there's a good number of people there. And so the latest is uh, the flow is moving towards Pahoa Town at a steady rate. I think the last estimate was 400 yards per day and it's projected to reach Pahoa Town possibly the next uh, two weeks. It's probably going to hit the edge of town, which is the uh, Pahoa transfer station, by next, uh, possibly next Friday. Um, they were saying by the 26th uh, at the earliest. And um, once it hits the transfer station, there's some there's some homes uh, in the path, and then it's going to hit the main town, uh, I believe the downtown area, um, kind of near the post office. And this is where a lot of businesses and restaurants are are established. And so we're just kind of waiting. Um, for it to, to reach the town, and then they're going to be closing off the, um, the main highway, which uh, is the artery for uh, all of uh, Puna to get through the, this town. So that's a, a kind of an impending, slow-rolling disaster, if you will, that's coming at us. What are you using, Nick, in the terms of uh, geospatial tools or 
inspection systems, uh, analysis systems, modeling a sim, these various factors to get better predictions of where the lava is going to go. So you can better inform the local uh, incident commanders and such of what to anticipate. Okay, um, well I'm not doing any predictions myself. Um, that would be the uh, HBO uh, scientists. So um, they are using a, a variety of tools. Um, one of their main tools is actually, uh, they're using the LiDAR data. And for those that don't know, uh, LiDAR is a uh, laser scan of the terrain, and they can create a uh, digital elevation model with this uh, data. And from that, they can try to predict exactly where the flow might, uh, might end up. And just like water, the lava is going to follow the steepest uh, path, and it's going to go downhill. And so they're using LiDAR, um, using satellite imagery, using aerial uh, helicopter flights. So they'll take GPS points while they're on the helicopter and try to get a flow front, and then they'll digitize it later. Um, so they're using a, a variety of GIS tools. Um, and then the county side, um, the county is using GIS extensively for uh, emergency route planning and response and different things like that. So there's, there's a variety of different um, technologies being used uh, as we speak to make sure that um, the best planning can be done for where to put resources. And I just got to mention, civil defense has been really awesome about getting information out to the public. They, they opened up a, a command center in Pahoa Town, and it's open to the public to visit for information um, five days a week. And so you can just go there and, and kind of find out what the latest is with the flow. So you can give us a contact or a reference to a, a website or something like that where this information is available? Um, there's, there's a variety of sources. So um, if you don't go to the county site, website. The other place you can get some good updates is uh, one would be uh, Big Island Video News. They actually post most of the meetings that we have here and they've been pretty consistent about that. So that's a great resource. Um, there's also of course the uh, HBO Kilauea Update uh, website that gives the latest maps from USGS about where the flow is. And then um, on the social media side there's actually a great site that uh, a colleague of mine from uh, the Spatial Data Analysis Lab created, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Mark Kimura, and he created a Facebook page about the uh, social, socio-economic data of Lower Puna, so giving you a snapshot of just how many people are being affected, um, what's going to happen to businesses, those types of things, and if you want to check that out, it's facebook.com backslash Lower Puna, and uh, it's definitely a great source of information. Okay, that's, that's a great basis for talking to David a little bit later on about integration of these various uh, sources. Before we take our first break, let's turn to Peter Webley up in Fairbanks. Uh, Peter and I met on the telephone the last couple of days as we've been trying to develop a UAV program and get the pieces in place that would assist in the very work Nick is talking about. Peter, Peter is with the uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory, which is a partner with the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. Peter, please introduce yourself. and. Uh, and follow on Nick's comments with how you see the evolving picture? Yeah, um, I'm a remote sensing expert up here and I work in the Geophysical Institute in the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And Nick mentioned about the use of satellite data. That's a big aspect of mapping a flow of, of, of this nature because it provides you um, access to, to, to data you don't actually have to collect yourself. It's, it's freely available through online sites at NASA and the USGS and this gives you an idea of the thermal activity of the flow as it's progressing through through the local topography and through the local vegetation. Um, this can get you down to 30 meter resolution, um, sometimes can even get you down to 10 meters resolution and can give you a view every day to, to, to a day and a half. And this can supplement what's being collected on the ground and obviously is, is available night and day um, and doesn't require an observer to go and collect information. So this is being used and by the um, Hawaii Volcano Observatory for that sort of analysis. Thank you. Let's uh, let's get to the Honolulu guys after our break and, and consider what Nick has, has said and Peter and think about how that comes together in an integrated sense and how we think about in terms of disaster preparedness. So we'll take a break here and come back in 30 seconds. Hello, I'm Martin Despang and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where it's a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity 
in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. One. Welcome back, everybody. Ted Ralston here, downtown Honolulu at the studios of Think Tech Hawaii with our program, Where the Road Leads, talking about keeping the road open. In this case, it's the road and the road structure uh, through Pahoa as the emerging lava situation begins to uh, uh, change the, the topography. We were just talking to uh, Dr. Peter Webley up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, talking about the big picture of the space satellite observation and the calculation of potential flows based on surface contour and flow models. We talked to Nick Turner about the specific information that's being developed locally in the Pahoa area and how it's made available to the public. Uh, what, what we were thinking about up in Alaska this week was getting the big picture established as Peter described and then improving that on an as-needed basis with little UAVs, unmanned aircraft flying in areas that, that, that uh, it's too expensive to get a, a big airplane in and, and maybe as a risky area or something like that, you can get down close to the surface and get high resolution imagery in order to sort of pocket fill in areas that are changing either through uh, landscape change, through land mass change, or through the lava flow itself. So let's turn to Eric on, on this side uh, and don't feel any pressure, Eric. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center in the PPC and how you see that organization fitting in as we're on the crest of a, of a potential <laughs> long disaster here. Okay, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center is a FEMA-funded training center, so we develop training and we deliver training nationwide on natural hazards. Um, and then, so right now we're focusing on the Puna area because it's in our home state, and we're trying to figure out how can we assist the Hawaii County State uh, Civil Defense and HBO and others. We have some bar scientists on the ground right now trying to figure out those uh, connectivities between our center, which is a training center, mm -hmm. and the people that are out there right now on the, on the ground. So we've been investigating issues with the, the vulnerable population, uh, looking at how we can assist when DOT to model the evacuation of that area. Do you have models and, and, uh, and such simulations and this sort of thing that you can look at pros and cons and evaluate different solutions to uh, displacing people to different uh, relocation centers or? Well, or once we identify maybe where these relocation centers are, where the population is, then yes, we have some models that we can run to see you know, what path they would take, what, what roads they would take. Um, like Nick said, there's only one major road that goes in and out of that area, but if the uh, lava crosses that road, then there's other ways they can uh, evacuate these people. So we have some scientists that are working on those things right now. So even though your primary function is training, that's what the title says, yeah. the organization, you are out there attempting to pull forth that real-time emerging situation and use it as part of the training syllabus, I yeah, would presume. We try to find ways to enhance our training. So mm -hmm. this is like a living laboratory, right, a case yeah. study. So we're trying to take the information that we learned from this situation and see how we can enhance our training to uh, prepare people nationwide. So you take the experience we develop here in Hawaii yeah. and, and distill it, package yeah. it, and put it into a national training program of some kind that where, where it's appropriate. Yes. So we, we have a volcano course, but it's been primarily delivered on the mainland, dealing with mm. the, the, the situation they have in um, with lahars and more um, explosive volcanoes. But this is, um, I think, a first for us to look at mm. this type of lava versus uh, versus these explosive type. Of well, you know, we have um, we have the uh, AVO, the uh, Alaska Volcano yeah. Observatory, and HVO working together. Uh, through Peter and, and Nick and people like that who can tie these things together. Is there a corresponding NDPTC agency in Alaska where this, what you're developing here, could be made available to them? Now our science director, who uh, is a volcanologist, uh, 
uh, Dr. Paul Tan. He, he actually worked with all the observatories to develop this course. So he's been in touch with Alaska's Volcano Observatory and as well as HBO as well as the other, other ones. So the training concept is a great way to pass information, pass technology, and pass solutions from how it's being developed in one area through the training center to other areas. Yes. It yes. can become a, a real adjunct to the evolving technology. Yes. Even without any new technology, the training function itself is a form of technology and yes. increasing our general awareness of what can be done. Yes. Great. Then in the same sense, David, again, no pressure, the issue of uh, continually having systems that can handle different formats of information and keep abreast of that, especially as there's this flow, this, this landslide of um, social media data coming forth and this sort of thing. Uh, how do you see organizations such as Oceanit just tapping all that line? How do you tap all that information and decide how best to stand up and go forward and rec recommend what to do? recognizing you have to get paid to do the work. So there has to be a grant, there has to be some other form of keeping you employed as opposed to the training center which has a training budget and it can operate in that different, slightly different channel. So how do you see that as a commercial company but also as a high tech leading edge? Yeah, I think as a private company, you know, we have to add different kind of value. And for us, you know, we're a technology company so we try to add, you know, that technology, next generation, you know, technology advantage, and I think, like, I agree with Peter that, and, and yourself, at the base level, having that satellite imagery is very valuable, but adding to that, to have the UAV data would supplement that, and you know, I think the next generation, we developed that iPhone app that we showed last week mm -hmm. uh, called Mercy, and that develops, um, you know, da damage assessments, but basically you have to go in the field and each individual has to create their own damage assessment report. And I think the next generation of Mercy would be using technology like UAVs to be able to get greater resolution in areas where a lot of times it's not accessible, um, but having digital elevation maps, for example, 3D maps, um, you know, within hours, whereas it may take days to get access to certain areas. You know what strikes me is that uh, the training system that, that you guys operate in NDPTC and the technology that you represent on the other, kind of the other end of the spectrum, you could actually use the training function as it evolves as basically a procedure evol evolution as well. Common operating pictures and the various things that are done to advise decision makers as to what the options are and where the real options are, and the false options, the dominant options, and the good options, and the, like the optimization here, could all be really established, uh, heavily influenced by, the, by an active training program. I hadn't thought of that until we're sitting here at this table. So the training has much more value than just the uh, training and getting people certification, yes. if we think of it in that regard. So you could, you could disrupt the training by bringing in technology that the training program's never seen and force the training system and the people in it to deal with this new information. And from that, we'd get a, a, a better idea of how to handle the, the opportunity for emerging technology. And then on the other end, we have the, the high-level sciences is being in, uh, continually in, increased with, with uh, again, the UAVs we've spoken of. Uh, Peter certainly has uh, knowledge of the, what's happening in the satellite sensor world as uh, satellite uh, sensors are having greater resolution and such. And uh, let's talk about modeling and simulation a little bit there. Modeling and simulation seems to me a, a, a really common tie that would tie together the technology, the training, and reach back to both Peter and, and Nick. So Peter, back to you for a moment. Can you say a little bit about the, uh, what we're saying, react to what we're saying here on the table, but think a little bit about the modeling and simulation, the aspects of modeling the fluid flow, the lava in this case, and its interaction with the terrain. Um, talk to us a little bit about that, if you can, and how we might think about that in regard to the training center or the training operations. I'll bet they haven't been tied together yet. I, I just have a feeling that the models that guys like Peter deal with haven't been picked upon to contribute to the training program. Let's just test that idea and see if that's true. So Peter, what can you tell us about, uh, about the, the subject of the modeling and how we might use it here in training? 
Well, I can add a couple of items. Um, you mentioned about the volcano training course, and I've actually been um, an instructor on that course only a couple of weeks ago in Red Bluff, California, um, where you go through a work with emergency managers and first responders. And there is a reality-based exercise where you interact with those that are in an observatory. So I think there's ways to build in new capabilities and new tools into that uh, reality-based events where you bring in new technology and new data sets that can supplement what an observatory can provide. And in terms of modeling the flows, um, the observatory will be uh, looking at fluid flows of the lava, they'll have trying to get detailed accurate maps of the topography um, and the vegetation. They're critical when you're trying to produce a model. Um, if those have a level of error or are not um, as accurate as possible, then you're going to get a bit of um, uncertainty in where the flow will go. Um, and you want to reduce that uncertainty to help in decision support. So highly accurate, high technology data really helps in decision planning for what's going to happen in a week to two weeks as the flow passes down the, uh, the uh, side of the, uh, the landscape. I think I, I've had a hard time hearing what Peter was saying, but I believe he was in agreement that uh, that uh, an interactive use of the of the modeling and sim would be really something useful to the in, in the training world. Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, we're always looking for new opportunities to in mm -hmm. integrate the real time and uh, actual software or models that are being used by the, the real you know the, the public or the, or the scientists out there because. Uh, the most most times the emergency responder or the first responder they, they want to know what is actually happening not you know just a lecture they want to go through actual exercises and things like that so um, we're always open to uh, integrating some simulation or modeling hmm. into the course and as far as the work that Nick is doing and his peers on the ground which is going to be at a scale below what Peter's talking about I believe picking up uh, local infill data, high resolution data where appropriate, uh, you could think of an almost make make this into an exercise where we look at the big scale, the big picture, look at the emerging smaller pictures mm -hmm. and have guys like David think of how that can come together into a, uh, a descriptive GIS based situation that would be of extremely highly value to the incident commanders and the people who are in civil defense and the government for making decisions. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so what we need to do is all three of us, all four or five of us, write our grant when we're done with this program <laughs> today and have it centered on NDPTC. In fact, you may have noticed on this program, people who are regular uh, participants here, we have a lot of NDPTC people at this table for a good reason. We're trying to load you up <laughs> and, uh, and, and have this become more more a, a broader function, a more involved, a deeper function than than than, uh, uh, and, and continually doing that. There's no better organization, Eric, uh, to have that responsibility, because there's no end to the utility of a new, a new technology entering the picture, and there's not going to be an end to the satellite work or to the uh, UAV work in terms of higher quality information, high resolution resolution information coming in. So we're trying to stand you up in, a, in that way. And I will say that uh, one of the things we did in Alaska was uh, try to do exactly that. And Peter's part of that, and so is Nick. We are going through the paperwork on attempting to get uh, a several different uh, of the COAs, the Certificates of Authorization, to let the UAVs operate in this area. It's complicated because of the legality situations and the tour operators and the other fixed wing and helicopters are gonna be in there, but that, Actually, that can become the framework of this training concept we're speaking of that would uh, uh, be useful, I think, to you and a, and a great value to others, especially as you push this out to other parts of the country. Yeah. So, David. Yeah, I have to say that NDPTC actually does have a tools course on damage assessment that evaluates different technology and tools that are out there, including Mercy, but it's almost like a bake off of all the different types of assessment tools and technology that's available and you know, not one tool may fit all you know any situation so the participants have the ability to try and play with all different types of tools some are um, free you know, open source tools other paid tools but they, you know they do have a class yeah. 
when it was first developed, there was there was no real active use of UAVs or UAFs, mm -hmm. so that could be easily integrated later as we as that becomes a more matured uh, technology. I think that's a that's a, a really good point. The integration can also be highlighted or emphasized or, or trained or learned through the training process. We experienced that about two or three weeks ago up at Makakila with the fire taking a small UAV up there. And if there isn't a, a means by which that new technology can be introduced into the information flow, it's very difficult to be used because somebody has to look at the screen, somebody has to make a decision based on it, somebody else probably has to validate whether it's leading us in the wrong direction or not. So there's issues that have to be put in place in order to allow new technology to come into the game. And once again, don't feel the pressure too heavy, but uh, <laughs> loading up NTPTC with those kind of roles is, in my mind, superb. And that's what we're all about here at this show, is to uh, bring people together and, and look at how these things can flow with each other. Nick, um, you, we began with your comment from the field perspective. How, how do you see new technologies new systems, new capabilities, entering the mix with, say, the, uh, the, the uh, island of Hawaii uh, County Civil Defense. How would a new piece of technology, pick UAVs as an example, uh, be made useful and available to the incident commanders in a way that wouldn't uh, uh, further degrade the situation? We won't want this new technology to be part of the problem. We want it to be part of the solution. So from that very much boots on the ground level, how do you see that playing out, Nick? I think, um, just like you said, making sure that the technology um, <clears throat> brings more benefits than those problems is, is probably the you know, most important thing. Um, but as far as benefits go with uh, UAV specifically, um, I think the biggest benefit is uh, being able to do multiple reoccurring flights uh, day or night. And I say night because um, one of the limitations of manned aircraft is it's very unsafe to fly uh, to do low elevation, uh, low altitude flights at night, and so this is where you can reduce that risk to human life by bringing in UAVs, uh, especially at nighttime. And you know, right now uh, they're monitoring the flow each day. They usually do a morning assessment flight, that type of thing. But once the flow starts to enter um, homes and subdivisions and and, and Koa town, uh, I think everyone's going to go into this 24/7 emergency uh, mode where you're going to need real-time information. Uh, around the clock, basically, and this is where UAVs could help fill that gap. And the other thing is, because your UAV field uh, team is in the field, you can uh, get that information out there quickly to the uh, incident commander because you can start mosaicing imagery right there with a laptop. Um, you can have your own mo mobile command center type of thing, and you'll just speed up the entire uh, information process a lot quicker. Thanks, Nick. At, at this point, we'll. Uh come back to how this all comes together after our next break. So we'll see you in about uh, 45 seconds. Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big healthcare issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the Internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Ted Rolfson here, folks, Friday afternoon at the downtown Honolulu studios of Think Tech Hawaii with our program, Where the Road Leads, and Keeping the Road Open is our current focus, thinking about the situation in Pahoa on the tales of what happened down in Puna, and thinking about how technology can be used to assist in understanding and dealing with and predicting and informing uh, those uh, emerging situations. We have David Takayama, we have Eric Yama, uh, Yamashita, actually we have a Yamashita yeah, and a Yamashita in your same organization, but they're spelled the same. I get not sure yeah. which one I'm talking to from time to time. Yeah. And then um, we have uh, uh, Peter Webley, Dr. Peter Webley up at Fairbanks, and we have uh, Nick Ryan on the ground, I mean Nick Turner, sorry, on the ground in, uh, in uh, Puna. We, we may get uh, a Ryan on the line next time, Ryan Peroy, he's not on the line today. We hope to get him on at some point in time and talk about this. So, 
uh, what we're talking about is multiple technologies emerging and maturing in their own domain, coming together in a, a higher level purpose at the informing center of these consequences, these emerging, uh, emerging natural and perhaps man-made issues. Um, at the top of the show, I suggested that each one of us in this room, on this extended room, probably has an idea of what would be the greatest thing that could happen in your particular domain to make this area all, uh, the whole situation move faster in terms of the general informing. And uh, so I'd like to have you all say what that might be in our last uh, uh, period of time here. I will start with my own. I've, I've often felt that uh, we, we become sort of a, uh, a trapped in our own language. That is, the language has limits in terms of how it can express things. And if we could somehow find a way to take these complex emerging adaptive systems and express their potential consequence in some graphical format, in some non-textual format that has layers that are easy to slice and you could quickly determine uh, by some graphical way where the logical path may be. Is it cheapest solution? Is it uh, uh, in, in involving the fewest displacements of people's type solution? All kinds of solutions that have different optima. And uh, some way that, that, that systems would be able to do that and yet retain accuracy and not introduce some kind of uh, uh, false indications and properly indicate when the latency is up and the data is no longer any good. That kind of thinking beyond our linear thinking into some kind of a state change in how we portray. And if we could start from how we portray things down to uh, how we then calculate and compute, it would, it would be interesting. Now, I'm not smart enough to do that, and I'm way too old to do it, I'm sure. But you guys, I notice, are a lot younger. And, and uh, so maybe that's, uh, that's what I would like to see, is some way to cognate this complex information in a way that is ironclad sound. So I'll, I'll start the bidding with my idea of what would be useful. We started with Ryan as we went through our discussions today. So Ryan, let's turn to you and ask you the same question. What would, from your perspective, uh, after, after having been through six weeks of this now and another six months coming, what would you want as your number one next development in technology to make how you see the world in this domain getting better? Is that aimed at me, Ted? Sorry. That's you, Brian. I mean, oh, Nick, sorry, I, I get you guys confused. <laughs> Nick, you know um, what I meant. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, I think right now, you know, Puna's been through a lot. We've been through a cell, a hurricane, uh, that caused a lot of damage. Technology was applied there. Um, it uh, was more of a learning curve, and I think with this lava flow, though, it's going to be a, a different type of event. It's not like a hurricane where it's just over within a day. It's going to, uh, it's going to possibly go on for months, uh, maybe maybe a year, maybe longer. Um, depends on what the flow actually does if it reaches the ocean. And um, there's there's a lot of different um, ways that technology can play a role in that. Um, everything from predicting where the flow is going to go to uh, you know what do we do with air quality? Is the people that are directly affected by the flow that live in HPP or Inaloa, are they still going to be okay to live there? Because now you've got fog and toxic gases coming from the ocean that, you know, mixing with the lava. So there's a lot of different questions there. But uh, just to bring it down, uh, you know, to earth a little bit more, there's a lot of people being affected. And I think um, you'll start to see their stories emerge over the next few weeks as they, uh, you know, become more apparent. So just to give you an example, there's a family that's currently living with me that just evacuated out of uh, Leilani area. And they wanted to make sure that they had their entire house moved before the flow actually cut off the main highway because um, in their mind it's you know not going to be a, a livable situation once once everything's uh, cut off and so do they just give up their home because there's no insurance that's going to cover that you know do they foreclose there's a lot of these um, uh, different social problems that are going to come up out of this and I hope they can help solve some of those problems um, and we're going to try to apply that in the best way we, that we can um, to make that happen. So it, distilling what you said now in just a few words, the ability to take the multiple sensor sets, the multiple uh, measurable characteristics and generate some predictive 
a predictive system of some kind that would allow the physical and, and the social to interact and, and give people options or it, it, it illustrate to them what may be coming at them. So they're making decisions more from their heads and their hearts perhaps and are uh, being supported as best we can. That's what I took from what you said, Nick. Yeah, I think uh, making sure that everyone has the most up-to-date and best information they can to make a uh, good decision for themselves and their family is uh, probably the most important thing you can definitely provide. Peter, we hit you next, and so let's run that, that same order in, this, in answering this question uh, from your perspective. Yeah, so from my perspective, I guess I can look at it from a satellite aspect. It's a fairly difficult answer, question to answer sort of what do you think is the perfect future tool that you'd like for technology. Um, and w w in satellite, um, we're really um, looking at spatial resolution and how often we can view the ground. Um, and uh, therefore, that's the limit for us. And, and with the, the large national organizations that launch satellites, um, it's not a quick process to go from a, a new idea to a launch. It takes time. But there are ways to do that. There's, there's a big program now called the CubeSat program. I know um, Hawaii has a very big CubeSat program, and it's growing in Alaska, and there's other places on the globe that are doing this. And this is where you can build and launch a small satellite quickly. So if you've got a technology or a, a hazard, we're not talking about getting it up there tomorrow. We're talking about getting up there in six months or nine months or so. But it's a way to get new technology into space quickly. And if this is something that can help multiple hazards, be a lava flow or severe rainfall and coming for a hurricane, then it's something you can get up quickly within less than a year and have a new technology in space for the next hazard that's going to come along. That's almost taking the, like the cell phone uh, mentality and applying it to CubeSats, if you will. So you can get something up there quick and get something going and generate return uh, in a much faster way than we have today, especially with a lava flow situation. It could be a couple of years. So we could even have a couple of cycles of uh, technology evolution in that, in that one period. Thank you for that, Peter. And now, uh, Eric, I think you're next. So I had this conversation today with a long range planner in the county of Hawaii, and they're already, you know, they know the immediate is gonna hit Pahoa, they, but they're looking at the long range over time because they're saying that the lava is probably going to continue like you said go all the way to the ocean and as nick said so you know you have ideas of the immediate technology but they're they were asking me is there technology out there tools that can assist them to make the long range decisions um and right now you know everybody's focusing on the immediate like evacuation how to how to deal with the um the lava flow the you know the, the actual imaging of the lava flow right now but uh, for the long-range planners there at the county, they're kind of thinking, oh, what do they do? Do they have to rezone the whole area? Do they just evacuate everybody and nobody's going to be living in that area in the future? You know, what, what, what decisions do they have to make? Um, so that, that's kind of, I was kind of thinking, what kind of technology is out there that can help to the, foresee the future? I don't, you know, I don't really know right now, but that's, that's something I think to think about. That's, that's interesting. That kind of goes back to what Nick had said about uh, methods to look at the consequences of this topographical change and the geochemical uh, change associated with all the emissions and such coming up and the uh, change in the botany going on. All of that has to somehow combine into a quality of life vector of some kind, and that's what you're searching for. Interesting. There's another guy thinking about that who's been at this table before, uh, Greg Nakano is thinking about that as, as far as sea level rise is concerned. So I think we need to get you and Greg back at the table again, because you are obligated to go twice in a row when you come to this table. Okay. And at some point in time, you may be obligated to run the thing, so just be aware of that, that threat. So thank you, that, that's great. So long range planning, and that's exactly what NDPTC would be thinking about. And uh, excellent. Sir, yeah. last man up. Well, I wanted to be more original, but I think I agree with a lot of you, you know, that we need better decision support systems. And by decision support, I don't mean that you press a button and the answer will be there, but, you know, a systems that will integrate, infuse data, and 
help decision makers make you know better informed decisions and you know especially with all the new technology that's coming in with social media satellite imagery UAV data all these new data sources data from you know, the public um, decision making is becoming more difficult because you have all these different sources and then you have the, the social component and the social component may not necessarily always be um, you know there are definitely models and systems GIS systems that have socioeconomic data but a lot of the data may not be there for example you have an elderly parent that needs to get out um, during an emergency um, special needs types of individuals you know that has to be taken into consideration and you know these decision support systems the panacea I think would have you know a better my vision would be to have a better way to make decisions with all these new data sources. That's reaching beyond the traditional engineering domains we normally task to go solve a problem and reaching into the cause and effect, the social, the complex adaptive systems. Perfect opportunity for NDPTC to hold a workshop on that very subject, especially since you got asked the question today and that's got to be the end state of the NDPTC thinking. What's the long-term planning? The counties must be thinking the same way. So yeah, this sure. is a great workshop. We can, we can have it right here in JFINL studio. We are having it right now. And uh, I, I appreciate you thinking that way because it's unusual to find the technical people thinking that way. They generally think what they think about. They don't think beyond that a lot. Well, my background's a planner, so. Oh, okay, well, that, okay, it shows. <laughs> okay. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, distinguished panel. We have uh, the farthest away person here is uh, Dr. Peter Webley up in Alaska, Fairbanks. Great insight from the satellite and big picture perspective. Nick Turner, who's going to yet again face another serious uh, circumstance that's going to hang on for a long time. Thank you, Nick, for your continued persistence and pushing forward in these areas and being on the show. Eric Amashita, who is uh, set up to go for next Friday, too, the way it looks, because we do two and two, <laughs> home and home. And David, uh, thanks so much for your participation here and your ideas. And I do think that, I really seriously think that a workshop that combines these thoughts, a one-day activity of some kind, mm -hmm. not in a conference room, but in the dirt somewhere, in the, in the flood zone somewhere, in where it's real, would be a great experience for all of us to uh, participate in. I'll be glad to help you script it out. I'll talk to my colleagues up there. <laughs> okay, well, let's do that, and then we can throw them some. Uh, we can throw them some interesting challenges at, right as they're meeting. Now, next Friday, the twenty-sixth, uh, Clement Jung from uh, Kailua will be on the show here, and um, I think he's bringing some other people on too to talk about the Kailua emergency uh, preparedness. Uh, Fair, which will be held on the 27th in the middle of Kailua Town in the uh, in the parking lot there, and we'll uh, take some of the ideas from these last several discussions, including this one, and aim them at Clement in the week ahead here, and and uh, put, jack him up a little bit in terms of how he might be thinking about some of these responses. I think it'd be great to have these preparedness shows actually embrace these kind of ideas. You know, what we do is we display a lot of stuff, a lot of gear but we don't display how it all comes together and how it helps making decisions. So we're at the beginning of that, and uh, NDPTC, thank God we have you here in Honolulu. Uh, can you imagine if we didn't have you here? You guys are like a <laughs> center of all this, and uh, it, it's, it's just great to have that hub at the center of the wheel, and all the spokes can report in and, and uh, make that wheel turn well all together. Okay, thank you very much, folks, and we'll see you next Friday.
So did uh, Jennifer come back with you?